and also train other people so that they may be able to follow Christ. Amen? And so, uh, we'd just like to welcome all of you and, of course, you guys who's here. Now, we are, what, second year, uh, this is our second year and we'll be celebrating our third year anniversary this coming October. And you guys are well aware that this year we're actually moving to another level. We're actually raising up deacons and we're going to ordain them on our um, anniversary, okay? And so with that, uh, Jay has been giving us some um, um, preparation in understanding what we are actually going through and what do, we do, what do we need to do as a church, right? Uh, it's not just about choosing someone who is skilled, who is able to speak. That's not what we want. We, what we want is the people that God wants to take that place. Amen? That uh, someone who is faithful and be able to, to uh, meet their requirements, the qualifications of deacons and elders eventually. All right? And so we do have a chalk talk, another chalk talk, just to prepare us as we have that uh, time. All right? Uh, that we know we are aligned in terms of, like, as a church, where are we going? What are we looking for? What's, what's the picture of this church? And of course, we're always basing on uh, God's word. Amen? And so let's go ahead and uh, hear from Jay. Good morning. You may remember that last week we talked about how churches have traditionally been organized in the 20th and 21st century. As a quick reminder, the model looked like this. A pastor or senior pastor is usually at the center where he exerts gravity on the rest of the church. There are at least three groups in orbit around the pastor. Closest in is the core, and then the congregation, and finally the crowd. This model can work quite well so long as the pastor at the center remains at the center. But if the senior pastor, for good reasons or bad, is removed from the center, chaos frequently follows. When the pastor leaves, the crowd wanders away first, followed by the congregation. And while the core will sometimes try to rebuild, there's often nothing to prevent the church from disappearing altogether. When one person holds all the gravity in the church, the church will always be in danger in the event that that one person is removed from the picture. So let's talk about a different way of doing church, a way that calls for plural leadership. We'll call this other model the New Testament church model or the early church model, if you prefer that instead. The New Testament church model begins with a person or a team at the center. And in the earliest days of the church, that person or team had been sent by an existing church into a new area where there was no church. During the earliest times of the church, people did not generally leave an existing church to plant another church just down the road. Most often, the new church plant was not in the same neighborhood as the existing church. That said, there was someone at the center of this new church plant, and that person or team would begin by teaching the Bible to anyone who would listen. And just like in the other model we looked at, a core would gather around the church planter at the center. The church planter would continue to share the gospel in the community and begin to empower the core so that they are able to join him in ministry to the people of the community. As the church planter continues to disciple the people at the core, he'll train them, prompt them, and encourage them to qualify themselves as deacons based on the qualifications Paul listed for us in 1 Timothy 3. And then by God's grace, the day comes when the fellowship is able to ordain deacons to serve in the fellowship. The church, of course, continues to grow in numbers, and we won't picture that just yet on the graph because we don't want to distract from what will happen next. The church planter continues to share the gospel in the community, and as he continues to teach in the church, he places special emphasis on getting everyone in the church involved in sharing the gospel as well. While this is happening, the church planter begins to focus his attention on discipling the deacons. And as the church continues to grow, the deacons learn to disciple others as well. And as the deacons increasingly become men of proven character, the day will come when they meet the qualifications of an elder and are ordained into that role. 
And I hope that you've caught on to what's actually happening here. The church planter at one time held all the gravity in the church, but he discipled the men and women who became deacons and the men who became elders. And as the church planter discipled those men and women into those roles, he also shared his gravity with them. He encouraged them to pull other people into their orbit. And now, instead of all the people in the church being held in orbit by the gravity of the senior pastor, the elders are actually pulling people into their orbits. And by God's grace, the day will come when some of those people will qualify themselves to serve as and be ordained as deacons. And the synergy that these multiple orbits create draws in even more people. And because a viable leadership development process and discipleship are in place, anyone who becomes part of the church at any point may qualify themselves to lead the church. So the church planter once held all the authority and all the gravity in the church, but now the elders have been ordained who hold the authority and the gravity in the church as they continue to develop more deacons and elders. And given the synergy in these intersecting orbits, I want you to think with me about what will happen to the church if the church planter is, for bad or good reasons, removed from the center of the church. Well, in truth, the early church, in the early church, the man at the center was not called the senior pastor. He was, in fact, most often an apostle or someone who had been sent to disciple the leaders of the church while they disciple others in the church. And perhaps you can see that if the man at the center of this model does his job properly, He'll reproduce himself many times over in the lives of the people he's discipling and ministering to directly. So if, someone ha so if something happens to him that takes him out of the ministry, we'll miss him, but the church will remain intact as the people in the church continue to be held in orbit by the gravity of the elders. In the model that we looked at last week, if the man at the center is removed, he takes his authority and gravity with him and leaves chaos behind him. In this model this week, if the man at the center is removed, there will be no chaos because he has already shared his authority and gravity with the elders. And that means that when he leaves, he leaves his authority and gravity behind in the hands of the plural leadership that can continue to lead the church. In the meantime, I think it's important that we understand that this second model is what Jesus did as he empowered the apostles to lead the church. The Gospels make it clear that Jesus spoke to the crowds and then selected responders. Jesus then discipled the men he had selected and told them to disciple others. In other words, Jesus established a great commission church that was committed to obeying what he had instructed when he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all people groups. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to do what I have taught you to do. And then he went on to say, listen, I will always be with you to the very end of the age. We need to add here that this second model, the one we looked at this morning, is also the way Paul did church. He was often the first man at the center of the diagram. And I guess that leaves us with the question, that was fine for the first century church in the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, but what about the 21st century church right here in North America? Will it work here? Well, I know that I'm asking you, I'm asking you and leaving you to answer that question, but if you were to turn the tables and ask me instead, I would have to say that I prefer to place my confidence firmly and squarely on how Jesus and the apostles did church in the first century over any model that the churches have created in the 20th and 21st century. I say that because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Next week, we'll expand these ideas so that we can make a distinction between a ministry model in the church and a leadership model for the church. And in the meantime, remember, at the Potter's House, we don't just want to go to church. We want to be the church. Amen. Amen. So we are seeing that, you know, what we are doing here in Potter's house is something that what Christ has established. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, management um, structures that we could think of. We could get, um, you know, consultants and they can give different kinds of pictures. But what we want is we, we want to go back to how Christ uh, started the church and how he organized the church. Amen? 
because we understand that you know he's he's the uh, he's the author of that and he knows it better than us amen and so that's exactly what we're going through and i i hope you are catching up in understanding where we're going and how that changes our perspective from what we normally see like the structure of the church having like okay you have a senior pastor it's not just me right because at the end of the day and yeah, that's why we're investing on lives of uh, the young ones you know last night we had uh, the the teens uh, meet up and to be honest these are the next leaders of this church and so we need to raise up you you need to be praying for that are you guys praying for it i hope so right we need to be praying and who knows you know god might also bring you up and uh, ask you to to lead this church okay and so with that you know, um we'll continue on with, with that but in this church we also go back to god's word right um pretty much what we're uh, preaching in this uh here in front in this church is it's all about god's word and we're teaching expositorically but at the same time we do have a sub-series and in that sub-series so in in our main series we're going through the book of what second timothy all right and we're almost well almost like uh almost done <laughs> for this year right but anyway um so we're going through that at the same time we have this sub-series and today we'll tackle that on all right and we still study it expositorically verse by verse but we'll go back to that and our topic for this morning we're going to talk about the invisible war and i hope you still remember that uh, the, the the reality of this truth right that we are in this battle and uh we we need to win that war that spiritual war and god has given us uh, a certain uh um, things that we need to be reminded of whenever we face this um, these things and so we go back to ephesians chapter 6 and let me read to you verses 10 to 12 okay and this is a sort of review just so that you, you can remember because it has been like a couple of weeks or probably more than a month now since we last studied this all right and so it says there uh, pretty much the nature of this spiritual warfare that you and I have. It says there, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces, of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places right uh, what we're seeing here if you're uh if you were there then when we discuss this we're not wrestling we're not fighting against flesh and blood okay i hope that's clear to you that we're actually fighting against spiritual powers of darkness these are things that that you don't see but it's a reality and once we fail to see this what happens is that we we try to fight it physically and brothers and sisters believe me the devil wants you to fight the spiritual battle physically because that's how you lose that's why you fight with you know other people that's why you, you, you get angry on certain circumstances in life. And God is saying, no, 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 no. You don't fight it that way. You have to first understand the reality of this and fight it with the weapons that I have given you. You see, Th that's the beauty of it. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, uh, he says there that um, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine powers to demolish strongholds and you, you know guys it's sad how the church doesn't learn this 
The church sometimes would come up with, you know, they'll come up with strategies, you know, they'll seek to mobilize uh, political um, um, action groups and those things, not realizing that what we're fighting here is really spiritual battle. We don't just come up with like strategies to draw attention to our cause. You see, Satan controls the media. I don't know about you, but when you just watch social media, you get a lot of trash there. And if we're not discerning, we'll start to believe. We'll start to, to accept, you know, probably this is, this is right. Not understanding that this is the way of the devil to attack us. And so with that, we are going to win this battle by recognizing that it's a spiritual battle and there are weapons that God has given us. And so he gives us that in verses 13 to 15. He says there, well, at least this is what we've uh, studied so far. Today we'll study verse 16. But it says there, therefore, he says, so he's saying, okay, you have this spiritual battle that you're facing. Therefore, he's making a summary statement. He's saying that, hey, okay, now that you know this, now that you are aware of this, therefore, what did he say? Uh, he say, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having it fastened on the belt of truth. So he gives us these, um, these armors, belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and uh, uh, as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So those are the three things that we've discussed so far, and hopefully you still remember it. Um, the belt of truth, and it gives us that certainty. You know, God has given you the certainty, right? And, and the, we're battling with falsehood. Day after day, there's just falsehood, and and just lies from the devil. We understand that the devil is the father of lies. Amen? And so we want to stand on the truth. As a matter of fact, that's, that's one of our core values, right? Truth. It's, it's, and the truth is we go back to God's word. Amen? There's certainty. When God says that, then you could bank on it. And, and of course, we mentioned truth is not open to re-evaluation. And this is going to be connected also with what we're going to talk about this morning. So we have the belt of truth. You're going to put it on. Put it on always. And then second is you have the breastplate of righteousness. And just a sort of review, that righteousness that we're talking about, there's two kinds of righteousness, right? One that is received from Christ. It's not a righteousness of your own. We understand that. Right? Because right before God, your best effort is just like filthy rags. That's what he says. And, and so he's saying that um, the assurance that we have is, you know, that Christ is in us. At the same time, we live it out so that we are in Christ. Now, if you haven't, um, if you don't understand that, if you didn't um, um, know that study, you could watch it. Okay? But that's, that's just an important factor that you and I need to understand. That righteousness that God has given us, right? And then, of course, you have the, uh, the last um, armor that we've talked about is the gospel, uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's the shoes of peace that we go where God calls us to do. So there's a sense of preparation or sense of readiness. Are you guys ready to be able to fight the battle? right and you are standing firm you're you're mo you're moving forward you're you have that sandals that's that has spikes on it right so that you don't just fall down and believe me a lot of christians that we see don't live in victory because of that right they're not ready they're not prepared they don't know the gospel and so brothers and sisters do you know the gospel that's an essential thing. So that you would be able to stand your ground and having stand all, that you would be able to fight. And so, this morning, we're going to talk about the shield of faith. 
the shield of faith. And a lot of us have this idea, what, what kind of you know, armor is this? What is it for? Where do we use it? As a matter of fact, that picture there is not the kind of picture of the shield that you and I need to use. And we'll learn that. Because there's two different kinds of shields that they were using for the Roman soldiers. You have one that is, and what is used here is, is actually four feet tall and uh, two or two and a half feet wide. It's pretty much that huge. It's like a door that you're carrying like a door. And there's a purpose for that, brothers and sisters. And we're going to learn that this morning. And so, if uh, you guys are ready, as we always do, can I invite you to stand up? And let's, let's read our passage in honor of God's Word uh, this morning. And that is uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Are you guys ready? Ready? One, two, three, go. Let's read it. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, Lord God, this morning. I pray, Lord God, that uh, this, this armor that you have given us will be something that we would be able to use, that we can understand the importance of it, and that we would truly cling to you, Lord God, depend on you, trust you, Lord. Because this is the only way, Lord, that we would be able to be protected from all the attacks of the devil. And Father, I just entrust to you, Lord, everyone who's here, everyone who's watching and listening. Lord, I pray that you would speak, that it's going to be you, Lord God, who would touch our hearts. And allow us, Lord God, to stand up and live for you. Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity. Be glorified. Be magnified in this place, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can now all take your seats. Our shield is faith. And faith is our shield. Alright? And this is exactly what we are given. Now, the, the question here is this. Jeff, what is faith? I think that's where we need to go back to because faith is just probably a very broad topic that we can talk about and uh, we need to understand what faith is. And, and of course, what better way to, to understand it by going back to God's Word because God does not give us a uh, clueless in this. He, he mentions in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, Now faith is the assurance of things Hope for. It's the conviction of the things not seen. Pretty much what he's saying is that you already, uh, um, you believe that even if you don't see it yet. Right? You totally understand that, okay, this is, this is what God wants and I would believe that. Now, here's the thing and we'll go back to this. Let me just say, you see, all of us have faith. The problem is where you're putting your faith on. We're going back to that uh, question is um, where are you placing your faith on? And this is going to be a soul-searching uh, topic for us. Why? Because we would understand that there's a lot of things that's going on in our lives and we are not being protected, we're not using the shield of faith that God has given us. And He has given that to you. The question is, are you taking it? And so, that word faith is actually uh, coming from the word pistis. And as a matter of fact, this is so used 240 times in the New Testament alone. Alright? And this, this word is actually telling us it's acting on the truth. You see, you have to have the truth so that you'd be able to use your faith. Okay? Because if, you're, if you have 
If, if you're believing or you don't know the truth, you don't know God's word, you don't know God's promises for your life, then you would be able to, to depend on what God says. And so that goes hand in hand. That, that comes together. You need to be able to put your faith on what God says for your life, but you also need to know the truth. It's not just about knowing the truth because a lot of us knows the truth, but if you don't live and act on it, that's not faith. Are you with me? Right? And so that's what he's saying. Faith is not based on feelings. Okay? Now, a lot of us get confused about this because, you know, we say, you know, I, I just feel the faith of the people here in Potter's house. It, it, it's not that. You see, faith and feelings are not, well, we, we get confused about that and sometimes we, we base it pretty much on our feelings. And if we do that, our feelings go up and down. I don't know about you, but that happens to me. Amen? And if, it, if our faith is based on feelings, then that's probably why we see a lot having roller coaster life. And God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. So it's not just feelings, but also sight. A lot of us would say, oh, if I see that, I would believe it. That's not faith. Right? As a matter of fact, as believers, as followers of Christ, you got to take hold on what God said in His Word. Because God is not like us. You know, sometimes we, we would say, oh, okay, I'll be there. Or people would say, oh, sister, I'll try. Have you heard that? <laughs> I'll try. Truly, are they trying? God is not like that, right? And so that's, that's why when God says this, you can bank on it, brothers and sisters. You could put your faith on it. And so whether you see it or not happening, and this is why this is so important, there are certain things in your life that's happening and you don't see God working. Are you with me? Yeah? And a lot of us would be depressed. A lot of us would be, you know, uh, having that anxiety, uh, having those, you know, those fears. And God is saying, no, I, I said it, didn't I? I will do it. And that's where faith comes in. Now, I, I like what A.W. Tozer said about this says there, any faith that must be supported by the evidence of senses is not real faith. You know, the, when you see it, to see is to believe, right? Anything that is supported by that, that's not faith. Because faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen or not yet seen. And so you see, faith and feelings, um, you, you see that the difference there is faith is based on a choice. you got to make a decision. I'm going to trust God. Whatever it may be, even if I don't see things changing in my life, I will trust and I will cling on Him. Versus, you know, feelings, it's based on circumstances. Oh, I, I'm going to be happy if you know, if this happens. If I get my promotion, I'm going to be happy. Um, I'm going to be sad if, they, uh, you know, because of this person, of this circumstances. That's not faith. Faith is going to be like going back to God's Word. You know, you can consider it pure joy, brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, you know you, you you go back to the promises of God that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And even if you don't feel that in your life at that specific moment, you're assured. You're assured. You can be at rest. And that's why this is so important. Now, uh, 
well, talking about importance, we'll see here in this verse the, the priority of it. He starts there that, that and above all, all right? Um, in other versions, um, in addition to all, pretty much it's not saying that oh, this is more important than all of the other things that I've just mentioned. What he's just saying there is that this is a uh, this is something that you and I need to uh, take up when especially when we go through trials in life when we go um, uh, in, in those times when you know it, our belief is there on the edge we gotta pick it up because it's crucial he's saying there above all he says there in in first Peter chapter 5 verse 8 we understand the reality and in the danger that we're facing he says there be sober minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him firm in your faith that's what he says knowing that the same kinds of suffering and uh, are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world he's saying that this is our this is our enemy our enemy is not our spouse, our bosses, those inconsiderate bosses, our annoying office mates. Those are not our, our enemies. Our enemies is the devil, the world, right? And the flesh. And so he's saying there that you have to pick this up. Also, John uh, write it in... Um, Oh, I didn't put it here. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. He says there, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Right? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. You know what that? As well as our faith, he says. Christ has overcome the world. And so he, that's the priority of it. You got to pick it up. And then he mentions about the purpose. The priority, we make sure that we have it. Okay? Second is the purpose. Make sure, um, the purpose of this, why God has given this to you is this. It's to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, I don't know about you. You don't have to be a Christian for a long time to know that this is a reality. How many of you have problems? Oh, we ha only have half. Uh, who has problems. <laughs> no, we have problems, right? You face trials. You face difficulties. And this faith, that the, the shield of faith that God has given you, let, let me just emphasize that. He has already given that to you. And we'll see that in, in number three. That's the question. But He has given that to you so that it will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Now, let me just mention this. Um, there are at least two different kinds of arrows that uh, is being pictured here. Okay, one in, in the in, in that time. Okay, the soldiers would would actually put it, dip it on something that is flammable. All right, and they would lit that. Um, it's a uh, uh, that flammable liquid they will light it up and then um, pretty much like hit their uh, adversary right and so what that would do is they, they, it would burn the soldiers right if they don't have that shield um, at the same uh, uh, at the same time what they also do is that they put poison on it Right, and so when that arrow hits, even just um, like not uh, just your skin, that that poison would actually go through the bloodstream, and that person would die in slow, painful death. And those are pretty much a picture of what the devil does to us. The devil does and sends us those arrows with fire and poison and god says there that you know you have to put up that shield of faith that that shield that 
if you you have that right position that and, and sometimes what they do is they dunk it in water so that when it hits the the um the shield it this uh extinguishes that fire but that's that's pretty much why it's so important the priority of it so we understand the priority we understand the purpose we have to understand the potential so when, when we say potential you see the potential is with that shield you would be able to quench not some but all god says you know i've given this to you so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows whatever that may be that the devil sends to you you have to understand that what god has given you is sufficient it's sufficient in terms of salvation you don't have to add something to it god's word it's already given to us the strength he has given that to us his grace is sufficient for us brothers and sisters and we need to take hold of that we need to to understand the beauty of it first john chapter 5 verse 4 for everyone born of god overcomes the world this is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith you see brothers and sisters um, in our family camp, right? What team won? Is it the red? Red, okay, the red team. Okay, <laughs> the red team, right? I, we gave, I gave some cards there, right? And those, the, those book cards actually are the armor of God. And it's a reminder. And it says there, at the back of it, it says, Overcomer. You see, brothers and sisters, you have to understand that that is God's will for you, to be an overcomer. Do you believe that? Now, it's one thing to, to say that you're an overcomer. It's another thing that you live as an overcomer. Am I right? We all want to be overcomers. Are we experiencing it? And that's where he's saying, hey, this is sufficient. You take this because the devil, it's not a matter of when or, or uh, like if. It's a matter of when the devil will attack. The devil will constantly send you those uh, fiery trials in your life. How will you respond? How will you respond? He says, I have overcome the world, Jesus says. In John 16, right? And so you have that potential that everything is given to you and the protection there is how does the shield of faith protect us? Through those darts of doubt. Doubt. You see, you go back to the first, well, pretty much where you see this trials or these arrows being sent by the devil you go back to genesis in adam and eve right and i don't know if you remember it but satan uh, was was saying to eve you know has god really said that right and then she started doubting well you know and then she comes up with a different answer and so that's how the devil tries to attack you and me. Doubt. You know, God has given us many rich promises and we are partakers of that, that divine promises. And the problem is, well, one, we don't know it. Second, we don't put our faith on it. Satan tries to bring doubt to your salvation. Oh, really? Are you saved? How can you be saved? You're still doing the same things that you're doing. And then you start thinking, oh yeah, probably I'm not saved. And then you try to work out your salvation. 
Well, you, you work it out. You don't, you don't work for your salvation. But that's, that's pretty much how the devil tries to attack us. What else? What are those, those things that the devil throws at you? When you doubt first um, the character of God, sometimes you doubt also the deity of Christ. As a matter of fact, you go back to, uh, you listen pretty much to uh, the social media and those things. They would tell you all kinds of crap. And they will even discourage uh, this disguise themselves as Christians and yet they will deny the deity of Christ. You have to understand that that's, that's so important. You know one thing that the devil tries to send our way? Discouragement. How many of you have been discouraged before? We all do, right? Especially if we're not ready. If we're not, you know, um, if we're not thinking about or understanding the spiritual battles that we're in, sometimes we, we have those discouragements. And, and the devil tries to bring this on, especially to those who are, like, serving him, Right? And God says, no, put up the shield of faith. Put up the shield of faith. The fifth is this possession. How do you possess it? How do you uh, get it? All right? Um, you see, the shield of faith, it says there, you got to take up. When you look at the other, the other armors that we are given, he says, put on. Okay? You, you always need to have those things. This time, he says, you got to pick it up. I'm not, just, I'm not just gonna put it on you. God says, you got to pick it up. And so you got to see here the two aspects of this, the shield of faith. Well, you see, first is that you got to uh, understand that faith must be received, okay? And this is something that you and I need to understand. Faith must be received. That means that you, you have to uh, appropriate it in your life. But first and foremost, that's not from yourself, but it's given by God. Do you believe that? Because a lot of things that you will hear out there, it's pretty much, you're going to have faith on your faith. It's because of your faith. You have a strong faith. That's why this happened to you. That's why you got healed because you have a strong faith. That's not true. Because that faith in itself, first and foremost, is given by God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says there, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Where do we get that? From Jesus. He's the author and he's the perfecter of our faith. And he showed it to us. It says there, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, brothers and sisters, that is given to us. As a matter of fact, when you go to uh, different passages, in Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 16, this is the, the, the situation where Peter heals this lame beggar, and they were questioning him, and he says there, uh, he answered this, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith, where did it come from? Huh? The faith with, with, which comes through him. It's the Lord who gives us that faith. And so, brothers and sisters, is if if you're going through that circumstances in your life, there's this challenges. You're gonna doubt God. You're gonna, you know, you, you can be discouraged. You can be disheartened. What what you do is, you go back to God, Lord. I need. 
I need you to strengthen me. I need faith in this circumstance in my life. And believe me, you'll have many of those. That's a saving faith. That's a gift from God. It doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. As a matter of fact, you guys are familiar with Ephesians chapter um, 2, right? Verses 8 to 10. And this is a, a foundational verse that we normally mention, right? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, right? It's not, it's a gift of God. And what he's saying there is, what is given by God? What is the grace of God there? Sometimes we just think it's just the grace of God uh, the, um, that you have been saved, right? But as a matter of fact, you also see there it's not just that salvation, but also faith faith is given. It's a gift of God for us. And you gotta be thankful for that. You have to go back to God. Wow. Thank you, Lord. He has given that to us. The reason why you are here is because God has worked in your life. It's not because someone invited you, someone dragged you here, although that might be true too. (laughs) But the reason you're here and you're listening, you're responding to God, it's because God has worked in your heart. But when God gives that to you, here's the thing, right? You receive that from God, faith must grow. Faith must grow. I don't know about you, have you heard of Muscular hypertrophy. Yeah? For, for the, uh, the medical people here. <laughs> well, th- this pretty much is, you know, we, we might say, oh, that's a uh, high polluting word. But it, it's pretty much something that you and I know. You, you and I understand it. It's the result of strengthening and training uh, muscles, right? The more you use your muscles, the bigger it becomes, the stronger it becomes, right? And and the same is true with um, our lives, right? The more you use your faith, the more it grows stronger. The more you use your faith, and you see that in your life, in the lives of people, right? God has given you faith and it must grow. Tell the person beside you, it must grow. Is your faith growing? Oh, I pray that that our faith is growing. The, and you know how it grows? On a Sunday, you listen to God's word, right? You listen. Whoa, wow, wow. That's, that's, a, that's a good message. I heard it. I, underst- I understand. I know the five Ps, right? Uh, the question there is, are you applying it? Hello? Are you applying it? Because that's when it grows, when you apply the things that God is teaching you. If you believe in what God says. You see, our faith is like a muscle that either declines or develops. Which is which in your life? Is it developing? Is it being strengthened? And here's something that I want you to understand. I don't, I don't want you to miss this. You see, the, the devil, remember, the devil tries to send that flaming arrows in your life. The devil thinks that it's to destroy you, right? The devil wants to destroy you. But God allows that so that he can build you. Because that's where you're going to appropriate the use of your faith in putting up that shield that he has given you and me. What the devil um plan to destroy you, God uses it for His glory. And that's just beautiful. You know, um, th- that is 
how God grows us. And of course, we don't want that, right? If it's just us, Lord, don't send me, don't allow these darts to come over my way, right? These, these flaming arrows. But God allows that because He's growing us. He's growing us. Second Thessalonians um, chapter 1, verse 3 says there, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. You know why? Because your faith is growing more and more. I love that. My prayer is that that's going to be the same thing that I would say about you guys. When I look at your lives, well, I thank the Lord for you, brothers and sisters, that your, your faith is growing more and more. And you see that, right? When you're sharing the gospel. The first time you're going to share the gospel, oh, that's, that's really nerve-wracking, right? How, how would I share the gospel? And then you trust God. Lord, it's you who will touch their hearts, speak through me, and you start doing it. What happens? The next time you do it, it's not as hard as the, the first one. So you keep on doing it. You keep on doing it. Now all of a sudden you get stronger in terms of your faith. You, you don't give up when you, don't, when you see that that person is not responding. You don't give up. Why? Because you know God is in control. Amen? When, when you're starting, you're pretty much trying to, to, to do it and, and look for that result right away. Right? And sometimes you get discouraged, but when you keep on practicing your faith, you go back to God. Lord, you are the one who changes. You, you are the one who replaces the stone of heart. That's what you said. And replace it with the, the heart of flesh. You are the one who washes our sins as white as snow. Right? And you get to believe that. You get to depend on, on the promises of God. You are developing your muscles, the, that, that faith muscles. The same thing when you have trials in your life. Something goes on that is not planned. Have you ever experienced anything like that? <laughs> All of a sudden there's changes. How would you respond? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to go back to God? Understanding that God is sovereign. And He's more powerful than anyone. Right? Here's my question. When was the last time you exercised your faith? Do you only do things when you are sure? You know what we call segurista that pretty much you put your faith on yourself or you're exercising faith that you know Lord this is what you want me to do and so I'll do it whenever I look at this and when I, whenever I think of faith and how God responds you know, I just look at this church. I look at your lives. And I'm just so blessed. I never saw this when we decided to, you know, let's go ahead and, and answer the call of God for this church. And yet when you see people growing, people responding, People praying for each other. It just strengthens our faith. Amen? That's, that's, that's a picture that, you know, I, I'm thinking of the life of also, I've asked permission, you know, Christian and Jet, you know, they, they, they just came here 
But at the same time, you see, and I'm so encouraged by them. Because it wasn't easy. You know, the thing, if you want to hear the story, <laughs> go ahead and ask them. But pretty much, it wasn't easy what they had to face. It was a step of faith. They knew what God wants for their family. That God wants their family to be together. They don't know how it would pan out. There were some like challenges, but they took it as, and they saw it as, oh, this is an opportunity to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to do it. And that's the challenge for us. When you have that opportunity, are you going to take it? Are you going to say, Oh Lord, yes, this is what you want. I'm going to do it. Regardless of I'm seeing things changing, regardless of what my senses say, I'm going to take hold of it. And when you do that, see brothers and sisters, you also reap the blessings of it. You reap the blessings of it. Now, let me just give you quick things on how you'd be able to grow this faith. You have to understand that faith grows, what? Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. And so you need preaching. You need Bible study. You need your daily devotion okay and it's not because that i'm gonna check on you oh did you do your the bible devotion no it's because it strengthens you it prepares you you see brothers and sisters the picture there of this uh this shield of faith is you're gonna pick it up right take up because the other things you have you already have your boots on you already have your your um your belt you have your breastplate but Sometimes the soldiers would be, you know, just lying down, you know, not prepared. But when the battle hits, you got to pick it up, right? You got to be ready. And you're going to be strengthened by it when you're listening, studying, reading God's Word. Now, the question is, what are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you reading? Is it strengthening your faith? Huh? In the car. <laughs> the radio. What, 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 what do you listen to? And so, that's something that you need to, to be reminded. Is it just feeding your doubt or strengthening your faith? We need this. And this also reminds me you know, that's the reason why we need to go to church. Right? And people will say, Oh, okay, I'll just watch. Okay? I'll just watch. You see, that's one of the lies of the devil in the 21st century. Because you need not just preaching, but we need people. You need brothers and sisters. You know why? Because in the army, the shield of faith, as I've mentioned to you, there's what they call phalanx formation. And even like, even until now, they, they try to use this, right? In dispersing people, right? But this is actually a formation wherein that shield that they have is actually linked together with the other shields of their... Um, brothers and sisters in the army. And that's the picture that we are given. Here, in the church, we're supposed to be linked together, protecting one another. Are you with me? Because the, the time that you get separated, you, you, you can be in trouble. Here, they get protected. Some would be um, putting their shield on top, Covering not just them, but also someone beside them or behind them. And, and that's the picture here. You see, we, we say this again and again. There's no 
Lone Ranger Christians. We need each other. Amen? You see, I need you because you remind me of the things that you know I need to do. But you need me. We need each other. And, and, and that's something that we need to be reminded of. If we want to be protected, we got to stay with each other. That's how the devil tries to, to catch, uh, like the picture there is like a lion, right? A roaring lion. And these, these animals would try to make sure that you get separated from the herd and then you're dead meat. In the same way, we can be that way. If we stay away from our brothers and sisters. I, I'm reminded of, you guys are familiar with that story in Mark chapter 2. With the, the friends, the four friends of this lame, um, the paralyzed man. Okay? There was this paralyzed man and, and it was actually the faith of his four friends that he got healed. It's beautiful. What they did was they, you know, there was a crowd. They, they tried to come up with a hole on the top of the house and they lowered him down. The big, the, the, that person who was actually paralyzed can't do anything. He was just being carried around. And that's the blessing of our brothers and sisters. That's how we get to strengthen because our faith interlinked with each other protects our brothers and sisters. And that's why we need to, to have that. And then of course, you need preaching, God's word, people, purpose. What do we mean by purpose? You see, God often gives us a purpose that requires us to trust Him. Amen? And I cannot just, you know, I, I was thinking of letter P. I don't want to put problems because it's not just problems that God gives us. Even victories. Even, you know, um, tasks opportunities, challenges that builds our faith stronger. Never ever forget that, that God has a purpose. And some of you might be thinking, Lord, why am I going through this? I want to quit. I want, you know, I'm just so discouraged. Why are these things happening? Always remember, God has a purpose. And, and sometimes we get afraid, right? Lord, I can't do that. Well, I can't, you know, share the gospel. I cannot do this, disciple. And, and this is why we need to be reminded of it. The Great Commission is given to us by, by Christ. And a lot of us just, you know, just step aside. And, I can't do that. But that is God's task for you. He has a purpose for you. It says there, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. And that might be something that is so nerve-wracking for us. Just me? I, I will make disciples? Well, it's God who's going to work in you. Did he save you? Yes. Now what's difficult for God to do? Nothing. Let me end with this. You see, with all of those things, brothers and sisters, you have to understand that the object of our faith is the utmost importance. The object of your faith. Because your faith is irrelevant apart from the object of your faith. Right? Where are you putting your faith on? And as I mentioned earlier, right? To whom 
or where do I put my trust into? Where do we put our trust into? Is is your is your faith directed towards you know what um, towards God or is it towards like an idol in your life? Is your faith based on your skills? Is it based on what you have accomplished? Is it based on um, this person who's rich? Is it based on your boss, your position in life? Where have you put your faith on? And you see, brothers and sisters, let me just mention this. Only Jesus Christ is worthy of our faith. Only Jesus Christ is worthy of Only He can give you victory. Only He can give you deliverance from what you're facing right now. Only God, only Jesus Christ can give you strength. Only Jesus Christ can give you hope. Only Jesus Christ can save you. It's only in Jesus Christ. And that's why we can be assured of the protection of the shield of faith that He has given us. Because ultimately, we're going to put our faith on Jesus Christ. On Jesus Christ. And with that, you know, sometimes we think, you know, what are the problems, circumstances that you are facing that Jesus cannot handle? I want you to think about it. Whatever you're going through right now, I want you to remember that Jesus Christ died, He rose again, and He reigns forevermore. If He could do that, what is difficult for Him? Is your problem difficult for Him? Believe me, brothers and sisters, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. How do we respond here? Let me read again Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And I'll end with this. It says there, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Brothers and sisters, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Brothers and sisters, Let's put our faith in Jesus. Trials will be still there. The devil will not stop trying to throw those fiery darts in your life. But be assured, you have Jesus Christ. Take up that shield of faith. And let us be overcomers. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you, God, for your word. And sometimes, Lord God, we think that this is so simple, but we realize how essential this is, Lord. We realize, Lord, that even the faith that as small as a mustard seed, Lord, can accomplish much. Because it's not really our faith, Lord God, but it's the object of our faith. It's only in you, Lord Jesus, that we can be overcomers. And I pray, Lord God, for your children to experience the power, the protection that you have given us, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that that would be a reality in our lives. I, I pray, Lord God, for for those who are just going through this life and they're just being peppered by all these darts, Lord. 
Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would give them that faith that they could see beyond the present circumstances and see the victory that you're accomplishing, Lord God, in their lives. I pray, Lord God, that they would be able to see that you are the potter, that you are molding us. And, and though it's difficult, Lord God, that we can still trust in you, that you are there every step of the way. That you will never leave us nor forsake us. That your love for us doesn't diminish. It's still there. You've selected us. You've chosen us. And you will sustain us, Lord. And Father, we just lift up to you our lives. Lord, would you use your people? Would you work in our lives, Lord God? That you would strengthen us. And with that shield of faith, Lord, that we will take it up. That we, we will live it out so that it will be stronger. It's stronger. It's stronger. For your glory and for your honor alone, Lord Jesus. Thank you. For you are a God who is true, faithful, sovereign, and who loves us. Lord, allow us to always remember that so that we can live this life by faith and not by sight. For your glory and for your honor, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Jeff. That is a very good reminder to each one of us. And above all, take up the shield of faith. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's all sing. Faith. Amen. I'm giving everything I give my life for it It's what I live for Nothing will keep me from All that you have for me You hold my head up high I live for you Greater is he That's living in me Than he that is in the world Faith I can move the mountain I can do a major crime I'm giving everything I give my life for this is what I live for Nothing will keep me from All that you have for me You hold my head up high I live for you Greater is he That's living in me Than he that is in the world I can walk the mountain I can do all things to cry
you, Lord, be glorified, be magnified in all our midst, in all our challenges, oh God, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a blessed day. Amen. Hallelujah.